Uh, good evening, folks. <laughs> We're going to get going. Um, so I think most of you know me. I am Sean Weiss. I'm the department chair here at the Spitzer School of Architecture. Um, apologies from Dean Marta Gutman, who normally does the pre-introduction. Um, she had to be downtown at another event this evening. Um, so we're thrilled to welcome Carol Hein. Um, before we do so, um, I just want to do our, our weekly land acknowledgement to say that we acknowledge that the Spitzer School of Architecture, grounded on the Schiff's be 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 bedrock outcrop of Harlem, is situated upon the ancestral homeland of the territory of the Muncie Lenape, Wappinger, and Wisquazichek peoples. As members of an educational community, we are ob ob obliged uh, to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed the City College of New York to grow and thrive on this vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers and historians, and add, um, we endeavor to build in ways that lead toward justice, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing consequences of settler um, colonialism. Um, with that, before I would like to begin by um, introducing uh, Professor uh, Jim Williamson, a uh, program director of the MRC. Uh, program who will introduce, introduce our speaker this evening. Thanks everyone for being here in the room and here on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Uh, Carol Hine is a professor of the history of architecture and urban planning at Delft University of Technology and also professor at Leiden and Erasmus Universities. Uh, she is UNESCO Chair on Water, Ports, and Historic Cities, uh, which is uh, what brings her to New York at, at this time. Um, the mission of the chair is to advance investigation on cultural heritage in relation to water and ports and contribute to solving contemporary challenges by exploring the deep history of water, heritage, and ports in the context of space and society. Among other major grants, she received a Guggenheim Award and an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. She's published widely, uh, tying historical analysis to contemporary development in her writing. And her recent books include uh, Oil Spaces from 2021. I want to read that. Uh, <laughs> Urbanization of the Sea from 2020. Adaptive Strategies for Water Heritage, also from 2020. Uh, the Routledge Planning History Handbook, 2018. Port Cities. Dynamic Landscapes and Global Networks from 2011. And prior to joining TU Delft, she was a professor for a decade at Bryn Mawr uh, College in, in Pennsylvania. So, so uh, has spent time, considerable time both in, in Europe and in the, the US. And so we are delighted to have you here to share, uh, share your knowledge and experience with us. And I just also wanna give a shout out to the admitted MRC students who joined us here today for our open house. And thank you for those of you who stayed for the lecture. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, let me just present also Matteo and Carly who are sitting there. So why don't you wait? Because without them, all of these activities that we've been having in New York would not have been possible. And they're also my co-conspirators or on these two new uh, volumes, so I'll send them around. There's a number of issue two, and I'm happy to have you take it because then we don't have to carry this back. But you, <laughs> so you can, and because the Spitzer School was so nice to actually, um, I just have to get okay, here. Was so nice to actually have be the the recipient of all these 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 books because we we didn't quite know where to send them. And if you want me to, I can also get the, the PowerPoint on oil spaces up and we'll do <laughs> a different lecture. <laughs> We've been talking about water all week long, so it might be time to change. No, but so thanks a lot for having us. It's a pleasure to see you all here. And I do invite you all to just interrupt. We can also have a discussion and a conversation. I don't need to be talking. Um, how much time we actually have? We have an hour and a half. So if we talk about, we can talk about I can get started talking and then we see what's what about 15 there. minutes already in, but maybe can start. Yeah, that's fine. So the so what what maybe I should start by saying why are we here and what are we doing? So there's a big conference going on at the United Nations with all on water. Now the point is that water now I have a is little bit of a problem. This one? 
That's what I'm trying okay, to figure it out one. too. No, I think I need to, there's a person entering. Should I do the admin also as somebody else also in the Zoom doing the admits? Uh, there should be someone else. Doing okay, it. great. Then no, I'm, I'm controlling okay. from here. Okay. So this was, so you okay. might wonder why talk about water and why talk about water in New York, right? Well, it's an island and there's a clear line between water and land. Now, if we talk about climate change, sea level rise, for islands, this is really a problem. I mean, there are islands out there that are already underwater or getting underwater, so it's very urgent. And sea level rise is usually the point that gets everybody talking, but sea level rise is not just one thing. We're also talking about drinking water. We're talking about groundwater. We're talking about the clouds. There's all kinds and forms of water that we need to acknowledge. So if we just assume, looking at this nice island, what would happen if the water rises? Well, I think we need to be rethinking our idea of borders. Where does the land start? Where does the sea start? And if we think a bit further, the island is getting much, much smaller. I mean, the towers are tall here, but um, whether that's sufficient is a different question. But for an architecture school, it really raises the question, how do we build with water for the future? And what we've been discussing also with colleagues who are water managers, maybe we should design buildings that are built for water rather than holding water back. Do we think about the materials and their composition? Do we think about the way in which they are embedded in water? Do we think about structures that might go underwater and pop back up once the flood has receded? How do we think about different times? Could we have areas that are flooded for a certain time and then a couple of hours later, we can go back out and recover those spaces? Well, so far, we have been thinking about holding water back. And we've been doing that in all kinds of projects. And perhaps the one that always strikes me most is the one on the right, which is a recent attempt at saying, well, the Dutch have always been good at building dikes and dams and keeping the water out. My house is uh, two meters under sea level. There are places that are four, five, six, seven, eight meters, meters under sea level. So just make a new dike dam that holds off the whole water of the North Sea. So somewhere between Norway and England, and I guess somewhere also across the English Channel. How do we get the big chips in and out? It's a different question, but that has not even been asked. But it's all about this idea we can engineer our, ourselves out of the problems that we have created ourselves. Or you could say, and architects love to do that too, this is another project for uh, Lynette Holmen in, in, in Denmark to, to put a new island in front so that it serves as a, as a breakwater and actually, well, protects, protects the coast. And you have plenty of these projects also going on for New York, right? I saw some of them at the Biennale in Venice. The question is there, and this is what I would love to hear also your inputs on and discussion about, is this the future way to go? Now, in the Netherlands, you have also, now, why is this not moving? That's a different question. There we go. You have recent projects, and let me just reiterate. So all of the white is the Netherlands. It's a tiny country of some 18 million or so. I can, I mean, you can think of a city of New York. I don't know how many millions do we have here now? Well, like nine in the city, but 20 something in the region. Okay, so that same amount of uh, people approximately is the entire Netherlands. Now, three quarter of the land, one third of them, two thirds of the land, don't get me, is, is probably under sea level. So it has been, the country has been an extremely designed. You have rivers, so the Rhine River coming out from Germany and then uh, meandering through the Netherlands. So this is a huge delta. And in this delta, you have like the, the port of Rotterdam, the port of Anf uh, Antwerp and so on. So in order to acknowledge the new water conditions, so more flooding coming in from the Rhine, for example, they have decided to redesign the landscape. And what I mean with that is traditionally we've always lived with flooding. You've all heard stories about the Nile where the river would flood, people withdraw, and when the river withdraws, people come back and they have agriculture and they have all kinds of practices. We tried to prevent this by building big canals, but now we've understood that we need to redo it again because we can't just resist 
we have to deal in a resilient way with water. So what they've been designing is, for example, new um, overflow areas for the rivers, and you see some of the designs here. And But doing these kinds of things requires political leadership. So for example, uh, I'm German, the Elbe River at some point was flooding, and it was up to each municipality whether or not they had flood defenses. So city A might be fine, city B goes under. And when a city goes under, and you know all of this and about this in, the, in New York, uh, Hurricane Sandy, for example, well, we are in trouble. So the Dutch have come up with a system that they say, if it floods, we're going to flood agricultural space and we promise the farmers to reimburse them for any, any losses they've had. Because a city is much harder to rebuild and much more extensive than a, an agricultural area. But that means that you have to have a plan for the entire country to manage water and to manage that kind of compensation. Now, this project is called Room for the River. It's a very nice project. The one place it didn't touch is the port. So the port is so economically important that it was not included in these kind of what we could call nature-based solutions. Now, let's see. I have a little bit of a problem here advancing my slides. And I do hope uh, for the online people that you can actually uh, see the slides moving. Because I've had trouble with that before. But if nobody complains, I hope it is. I don't see any signs online. But let's just hope that, <laughs> that that's OK. Um, now, in this context, what we've been bringing to the UN here is to say, we want to look at water and heritage. The question is then, well, one, what do we mean with water and heritage? And I'll get to that. But the point here is that much of the landscape has been shaped over centuries by designers, but also by general forces like migration. So a country like the Netherlands, we often say there has no, there's not a stone that hasn't been turned around. It's so small and it has been worked. I mean, it's very different from the United States where you believe or seem to believe seemingly have an unending space. Now, it means that we are living in a landscape that is completely man-made and it is our heritage. Now, that heritage we have to deal with, but we need to do that in a way that looks at water as a system. Because the one thing we always tend to forget that water is not stationary. It is, I mean, it seems so, so easy, but the architecture, the building is stationary. The water is constantly changing. It's changing in its quality and it's changing its, let's say, its saltiness uh, or its chemical conditions and so on and so forth. Now, what we started out to say is that humans have lived with water, have shaped water, and have lived with it sustainably for centuries? Are there things that we can learn from the past in order to rethink what we do today and then to better design the future? And so on the one hand, it's about protecting historic water heritage sites. You have a, the Harlem stage just across the street, that's one of them. Um, but is it enough to protect that kind of a building or do we need a systems approach that embeds this kind of building in a much larger landscape? So if we, why is this note? So this also means that we have to think about water heritage in a more comprehensive way. It's about spatial development, it's about society and it's about culture. And what I mean with society is that we have established often institutions over hundreds of years, at least in the Netherlands, we have the water boards. That's a, one of the earliest democratic institutions some 800 years back to regulate water flows. But once you have established these kinds of institutions, they will also determine how you continue to work with it. They can block, they can facilitate, uh, and you have to really uh, acknowledge that and take it into account. Now, why does this matter? And why does it matter that we think about even the word water and the word heritage? Well, you have all, many of you have probably experienced this still. So if water floods, if we have a hurricane, if we have a tsunami, whatever, this water, for example, clean, um, touches up the ground. And if the ground is polluted, if there's a refinery, the oil remnants, the chemical remnants get swept up into neighborhoods. 
So it is urgent that we think about water and its impact on the landscape, the buildings, the cities. Because some of these things have been happening, like in Philadelphia, where refineries and all of these sites have been built next to rivers. So the Schuylkill River, this was the, until I think last year, the longest still running refinery in the world. So for 150 years, the soil has accumulated, here's a little bit of our oil story, has accumulated all the remnants that have been dropped into the soil. They actually didn't know how to clean it up uh, and then resold it to a, to kept the refinery running. So it was easier to keep it running than to start cleaning it up or to use it as another energy hub. Now, why I'm showing this is also to say that there's depth in water. We tend to look like I showed you in the first uh, maps at it as a flat thing. So here's blue, here's white, and we're fine. Maybe the line shifts, but the quality of water also changes in the underground. And that is much more complex than just, um, than just these lines shifting. For example, even if the salt water moves in further inland, it changes the pattern of the groundwater. And in the Netherlands, uh, some another university, Wageningen University, they're now developing new plants for these much saltier grounds. So all your veg vegetation may change. The, the fishes, the, the, the animals living in the sea will change as we do no longer have that kind of access to groundwater. Now, thinking from that, let's take a step back and think about what are the kind of landscapes that we are then actually talking about. And I was going to start with this book, which we made a couple of years back called Adaptive Strategies for Water Heritage. And when we started thinking about it, we said, well, in terms of architecture, what are we actually talking about? What kind of architectures do we have that are water related? Well, for one, we have drinking water. So this is how we divided it up at the time, saying, let's think about architectures for drinking water, agriculture water, land reclamation, and so on. Now, in that context, if we just think about drinking water, you definitely have history lessons for <clears throat> most of you. Can anybody think about a historic site for drinking water? I'm just curious here. Yeah, historic site for drinking water. I'm thinking of the, the potable water systems in France, the, the bond that we used to go to Paris. So like the, uh, like this? Watersheds. A watershed. Exactly. So historically, we have seen even these crossings of water with rivers being crossed by an aqueduct to carry water to the next city for hundreds of kilometers. Rome, for example, only could exist as long as we have aqueducts. But there are other places that are very intriguing and they thrive usually when they have communities around it. And Sukrit can probably tell us more about this one, but you, you could. So these are the kind of, um, uh, what, Step wells, why, why don't you say it? So uh, step wells are traditional uh, you know, wells. Uh, and I think the royal families kind of understood that uh, the entire process of getting water was a social process. And that is why they turned uh, these areas for uh, the collection of drinking water as plazas, we can say, which is why you see all the steps and interestingly, uh, most step wells in India have a very feminine uh, relationship because the women would go. There are actually many step wells that have also been, um, you know, uh, made by women with their, including sex workers, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very interesting story. I can, you know, that a lot, but, you know, just to really put it in a very brief manner. So, great. So these are mm -hmm. architectural products that also depend on community relationships and on cultures, because there's also festivals and ceremonies associated with them. Yeah. Now, if we take this kind of relationship, well, what does this mean? And we can come back to that because we have Sukrits and other people's great expertise here in the background. Now, agriculture, what do you see? I'm almost looking at Maud here, but um, it, set, it sets up their uh, agricultural waters. Well, for all of us, is this, is this an engineered landscape? Yes, it actually is. Because people have made landscapes, you can use ice 
uh, let water run over fields so it ices up, which protects the plants, helps them grow earlier. Or you have systems of letting water trickle through the meadows. So there's a whole system throughout Europe with these, with these particular water meadows, and they are captured in art. So the role of art as a communicator of technologies, of way of uh, designing the landscape is really, is really key. And we can even go a step further and think about the rice terraces of, of Asia. And what we usually forget when we see these nice pictures, because that's the picturesque and colorful part, but they start at the top with the forest. The forest is there to capture the mist from the air, drain it down and also serves the water then to trickle down. Having these kinds of um, rice fields means that we have to be quite peaceful because you have to, you can't pick a fight with your neighbor and expect him to lead the water in your rice fields. So there are actually anthropological studies about the culture or the non -cult or the culture of non-conflict in Asia as being uh, developed from the kind of sharing practices around water for rice fields. And then you have communities downhill and these communities have all kinds of practices to maintain the, the rice fields uh, and the songs and the things that go with it. And Sukrit, I'm going to ask you later on for the musical interpretation. Um, so another way of dealing with water is land reclamation very different way to do it. So in the Netherlands here, we have a site which is called Kinderdijk, which is the windmill landscape, which was designed at the time to get water out of the polder. So entire families were living in these mills and you couldn't get away. I mean, you had to, you couldn't just go for three weeks on holiday because the water would keep on streaming in. So you lift the water one meter up, two meters up, and then out into the river. So the life that they were living, the practices may have been very sustainable using wind to get the water out. But I'm not so sure that everybody would have wanted to live in them and, or even in the step wells that Sukrit was just describing, whether the role of the women is something that we would accept today. So the question of sustainability, when we talk about environment and environmental sustainability, does not mean that it's socially or culturally sustainable. Uh, and here's an interior of the site in, in some time recent. So we need to understand that these sustainable practices, at least environmentally sustainable practices of the past, were uh, changed out against industrial energy. So whether it's steam energy first or oil driven energy and these kind of pumps would then help get the water out. Now, this is for me a, a perfect example of what water heritage can be. So this is a pumping station, Amsterdam style, in the north of the Netherlands, helping to get the water out. It is no longer, usually no longer in use, only in case of really flooding, they would put that one on again, it can still work. So you can say it's, it's a living heritage, but it's also one that is fueled by petroleum. So when we think about sustainability and we think about World Heritage Sites and how to protect them, we can't really say, yes, we want to protect the heritage of the petroleum, but we also want to overcome the petroleum. So there's a whole argument that we have to make to say why these beautiful uh, elements and this beautiful machinery needs to stay in place. And there is a story, there's also a question of what stories do you tell? And that's an invitation for all of you to, to reflect upon which, which examples you choose for your project, for example. So this is a area in Japan where there was a brackish lake. So you can imagine kind of the mixture of salt and sweet water where particular fishy, fishes were. And under Dutch influence, they built, a, they built dry land, a, a polder in, in that area. And they've been celebrating it ever since. There's a museum celebrating how great we were at gaining land from sea. Now, the story of the fishermen who lost their work and who lost the fish is rarely told and is certainly not really acknowledged in the museum. So when you choose your historical examples, you say, yes, we want to design with or for water. Well, whose story do you acknowledge and whose story do you fail? which is also a question you were uh, talking about the indigenous people living in this area before, how did they live with the Hudson and the East River and engage with the wetlands, et cetera? 
So rather than saying, oh, let's celebrate the history of industrialization, let's acknowledge the history of industrialization, but also point out its, its uh, shortcomings and errors. So usually when we talk about building for and with uh, water, we also can think about these kinds of defense lines because that's also a way of not defending ourselves against water, but using water as a means of defense. And then there's the whole field of uh, river and coastal planning. And I'm actually fascinated by rivers because rivers do less. Um, we study rivers often less than sea seas, at least in my experience. And you're shaking your head, we can discuss this later. Mm -hmm. But um, rivers are fascinating and because they have drinking water, traditionally, that works. They give us food if we fish. They serve for pleasure, sometimes even for washing clothes, and they serve for transport. But if any of these functions pollutes the river, then the other function is usually in, 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 in deep trouble. So as soon as we start putting industry on these sites, we can no longer use the river as a, as a place of drinkable waters or even of eating, eating the fish from there. So that brings me back again to this idea of what do we celebrate through paintings and art? The Netherlands has Amsterdam, its capital, with the beautiful Grachten, also a, a World Heritage Site. But we also see the celebration of, well, the VOC as a kind of colonial uh, dominion and its, its con colonial realm around the world. It's just like Britannia ruled the wave, waves, uh, the Netherlands were for 200 years the only ones allowed into Japan, for example. They had large, large colonies all around the world. And those are the images that survive. We usually don't see those same images from other areas of the world. And we continue to celebrate them today in the center of the city. This was the headquarter. And it attracts over and over attention, for example, through huge cruise ships that will then celebrate those same sites. Now, I was going to show you, wait, come on here. Um, this is one of the more historical sites and then the World Heritage Site of, um, of Amsterdam today. So what we choose as heritage is, tells us also something about the history that we have been living in. Now, port cities and waterfronts are yet another example of how we think about water heritage because these port cities, this is my hometown of Hamburg, have a history of well, it's a beautiful site. It's, it's definitely worthwhile preserving, but it's also a history of demolition that we are celebrating. So this site was built in after 1888, um, when Hamburg, a free state, free city, free state, decided to join uh, the German Empire. And Bismarck finally, right, Bismarck said, okay, we give you that many millions of gold mark so enough to build this entire warehouse district and he said okay we give you free trading port so that you can get your goods in and out without even paying uh taxes and with that hamburg joined and the only statue we have in hamburg is the statue of bismarck because there's never been a king or another aristocrat that has been uh, honored in that way so the way that we develop heritage we constructed for different purposes is something that is also key for, for architects. Now, there are more things which we didn't treat yet in the book, for example, energy. And maybe I'm gonna throw you another question right now. What do you see? Anyone? Hmm? The windmill. The windmill, yes. And the other thing you cannot really say is, unless uh, Maud gives us the name, the Wollmolen. Mm -hmm. So this thing in the front is also a mill, but it's a water mill, which is used to gen generate energy to making wool. Now, this means they're using the water from the river to create power, which means that the water is running into the polder. It takes, six windmills to get the same water out again. Mm -hmm. So it means that the people who are making the wool use the water, the energy for free, but the public sector pays for getting the water out again. And I think that's a typical example even of today that some people get free access 
to whatever good we are talking about, which then for the public sector is being taken out. Any guesses how long it took to solve that problem? It took 300 years. I really don't think we have the time to do that kind of uh, uh, problem solving anymore today, but it's important to know. And that means that we need to think about different institutions that can help us regulate our water problems. So historically, we've had water tribunals. The Dutch have the water boards. I actually don't know what's happening here exactly. Who is, uh, I hear some laughter in the background, but uh, I would be curious, maybe we can discuss it later, what kind of water organizations are in place. And we often forget about rituals. We used to have a lot of rituals. Water, the sea used to be full of sea monsters and all kinds of knowledge and beasts. And I don't know for the students, are you drawing on your maps any monsters and uh, dragons or whatever kind of things? Saturdays. Huh? <laughs> Only on Saturdays. <laughs> well, maybe you should challenge your teachers and good also the Monday, Monday through Friday. And it is not only about rituals that we have been having for centuries. It is also about creating new rituals. And I mean, these are still old rituals. So this is a ritual in Japan when uh, a, a river was opened while I was there, but I've come to that back. And we have leisure. We have all kinds of living with water that are very diverse and uh, well, and also different even along the same river. So we need to be careful when we say this is the Elbe River which part of the Elbe are we actually talking about? Are we talking about the landscape close to the source? Are we talking about the Elbe River in Hamburg? Or are we talking about it where the big container ships come through? So it's not one thing, it is actually very, very different, which is one of the reasons why I like the UNESCO Historic Urban Landscape Approach, which, try, which says that these heritage sites should be embedded in a landscape thinking, in a system thinking, where um, tries to em em embrace local communities to develop more sustainable approaches. And in that, so if you haven't, is anybody familiar with the historic urban landscape approach? Hands up. Only Sukrit. Can you, <laughs> and Mateo. Okay, Sukrit, can you tell me more what you, what, what you know about this? So, uh, like, kind of merging the historic aspect with the modern day uh, thing as well. And since uh, bringing landscape and its nature is also something that people have kind of uh, ignored when uh, talking about heritage. So bringing all these aspects together, I think is the historic urban uh, landscape. And uh, I think there's a concept of precincts that was really famous at some point of time where people tend to uh, divide you know, cities, the historic district and the main district. And I think there's been good talks and bad talks about it. So the landscape aspect, I think, has been so far the most successful one because people have only appreciated it because it considered nature as a part of urban uh, design and a very important aspect of it. So. Right, and so there's a lot of mapping involved in this. I'm just going to show you one or two. With this idea, how can we embed the heritage sites into the larger thinking? Now, one of the reasons why we are here in the, in, in, in the US is the Valuing Water Initiative. And this Valuing Water Initiative, it's one of the UN principles, but it's also an initiative by the Dutch government to say we need to find new ways of valuing water. Because so far, it's usually the economists who kind of put some kind of financial money to it, a financial amount to it. And when we were discussing then, and I say water and heritage, they say, yes, but how much is your heritage worth? How do I put the number onto heritage? So they, you, you can't really value a ritual. So, we are really looking now for new ways of appreciating the way that we can value um, water. How do you value a site like Amalfi? And when you see, when you're out there, you see these huge yachts in, in, in front of these cities, they just benefit from the, the, the spectacle in the background. So that's a very different way of looking at it. Now, what we've been doing here, and uh, maybe giving you a little summary of what we've been up to, we started in, in Philadelphia at the Fairmont Waterworks as an education institution. And we've been, this, uh, we had a visualizer with us who uh, kind of drew our journey now here to try and bring attention to, to the relation between water and architecture, basically. So you've already seen our, our blue papers and take a look. We're looking always for more 
uh, input. But one of the things that drives me is to say we also re have to rethink what we mean with sustainable development or sustainable development goals. Because the, in this case, we start with water. There's the SDG 6, there's the SDG of uh, underwater, there's SDG that depends on life on land, but that depends on water. All of this is part of larger framing conditions of energy, of climate, because we've always lived with climate whether we build in the Arctic or whether we build in the desert. Over hundreds of years, humans have ingeniously made their place to living with heat or with cold. A city like Yazd in, in Iran, where you have ice in the summer, in the desert, how, can, how is that possible? And then using these kinds of ancient systems to cool down the air. So you have canals that are underground that channel the water from the mountains to the city and the air is being drowned into the ground to create natural air conditioning with wind pipes coming out uh, on top. So we have been able to live even with 40 degrees climate without using oil, for example. So now the, that the climate is changing, we have to ad adopt our buildings and make them work with the climate we have. So I try to come up here with the idea that there's water, their framing condition, and actually all the rest are cultural practices. The way we feed ourselves, the way we deal with health, the way we build cities or infrastructures is all a result of our cultural choices, as are all the other SDGs. But the point here is that none of the SDGs really covers it all. So when I talk to people in ports, they say, I'm in the wrong water. I don't have an SDG, right? because I'm talking about shipping and not drinking water. And for the same thing, you can say, well, there's no SDG for, and you name it. So that's why I think we should really be, be, be discussing a much broader uh, theme of sustainability and, that, and accept that these SDGs are points on the horizon for 2030. What about 2040, 2050? I mean, we are architects, come on, we're not building, all our buildings are not going to end within, what is it now, in the next seven years, right? Um, and I had a nice conversation with one of my colleagues, uh, Vinnie Maas and Verde V the other day, where basically architects are always late. Because when you build an airport or something, you make the plans 10 years ago, you go through the project, the process, and by the time this thing actually opens, you're actually enshrining something that you've already imagined in a time that was completely different. I mean, the, the, the airport of Berlin, which couldn't, or when it was finally opened, all the hardware was outdated, so they had to do it all over again. Just to give an example. So it's, I think, really important to think about time and these, the fact actually of building the heritage of the future. Now, in order to connect these two fields, I'm trying to say, well, we need to share the same words. If we talk to them, the heritage side, we have to know what actually is water because we tend to use it in very different ways. There's water for everyday practices, for cooking, for uh, drinking, for swimming, but there's also water on the bigger scale that water managers will use. We build pipes and pumps. It's not quite the same thing. And then there's the entire water cycle. So for many of us understanding what water is is important, but for the water manager to understand what is actually heritage. Are we talking about world heritage that has to be protected? Or are we talking about the CO2 in the air, which we might also say is heritage, but it's definitely not one that we want to keep, right? So when we address this theme of what is water heritage or water and heritage, I would like us to come up with very clear definitions what it is actually that we want to talk about. So some colleagues think about water management related heritage. Those are the pumps, the dikes, and so on. But we can also talk about swimming practices, or we can talk about the landscape as being shaped in line with water. So this is the kind of background that we led us also to make the, the books that I've been showing you. Um, it is also in line with other attempts that we are trying to, and this may be very architectural, we can discuss all of this, but to try and capture these different water practices through, um, through icons. Now we came up with 10 tangible and 10 intangible ones so far. These are not necessarily the, the final ones, but if we want to say, think about how language or laws and policies shape our water practices, 
we should better come up with very clear ideas. So what is interesting in this in these texts that we are now having, there are very different articles. And I think this is, this is um, well, at least how I've been seeing it. And I'm curious what you guys think, but mostly in the, in the humanities, people withdraw to write a PhD and they emerge from the cavern after five years and they have a big book in hand. Now, that's great. And I've also done that. It's also fine and fun, but it's not very sustainable. So when I talk with computer science colleagues, they will write an algorithm, publish it, write a data set, collect the data set, publish it. So it's a very different way of, of working. So what we've been trying to do with this publication is to come up with a, a model of publishing short texts that are still peer reviewed, 1,500 words, something that's almost like a, I'm gonna say high school essay in, in the United States, but, um, but all in the field of marrying, matching water, culture, and heritage. And so you have pieces about religious heritage or about world heritage discourses, very different um, approaches. And so the idea is to create with this a basis for interaction. Now I asked the uh, Italian and uh, Matteo and a couple of the others who've been working on it, what their favorite ones were. I don't know if either of you wants to jump up and uh, I re don't remember which one each of you chose. I think, no, I know, Matteo chose this one, right? Matteo, do you want to tell us why you chose that one? Very interesting uh, combination of uh, um, traditional laws about water management was much more sustainable and uh, socially inclusive. Think about the subac system in the Liga. Uh, compared to the ones that are uh, implemented now by the national government, uh, and uh, the way also supported by the by the World Bank, that open up the system to industry and to uh, neoliberal markets, having a lot of repercussions for the people living in the area, pollution, carbon scarcity, because the water is really like for the rest of the people. Yes, and it raises the question about hidden designers. Because we are, as designers, we want to shape buildings and physical stuff that we can touch. But much of the buildings that we want to design can only be designed in relation to the land, the size of the land, the building, um, how do you call them, the building uh, uh, laws, the, the urban planning regulations, the existing infrastructure, the sewage lines. So as architects, we depend very much on those hidden designers that are not always, I mean, there's people coming in. Let me see if I can let them into, there we go. Um, that we can uh, bring in. And I think, Carly, you, you chose that one, right? So that one is about. So um, this, so the slide before. Sorry. Uh, this article was uh, written from a perspective of a, from a perspective of religion, where it talks about the, spiritual significance in attach or used to attach to water to how water was worshipped in certain communities and that perhaps if we uh, went back to this view of water as a divine or as a, a thing to be worshipped, respected, celebrated, it could help in sustainable development. So it was a very interesting perspective for an architect to kind of see water in this thing. Yes, and, and uh, my personal favorite from the first issue was this one, where we, if we look at the past and we say rituals help sustain buildings, landscapes, society, because we have that culture, can we imagine new cultures, new rituals that can sustain a change in buildings? So these Polish um, women were actually protesting against the pollution of a river and they came up with a new ritual of river grief um, because the, 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 the source of the river was polluted due to mining. And that the fact that this kind of uh, pollution occurs is also important to, well, to put out into the open. And I do think that architects and planners can really make a difference here, particularly because we can visualize and it's such a powerful tool that a colleague in Delft, they have been visualizing all kinds of uh, water systems in a standardized way to make them really comparable. 
and other colleagues have been in Dunkirk working on these kinds of visualizations to show how a water system is embedded in economic and material flows, showing, for example, that the historic polder, the water that's drawn out of it into the sea, is the same amount that they need for industry. So if we had come up with circular system where the water of the polder is actually fed into the industry, it would have been much more, um, much, much more efficient. Now, I'm just looking a bit of time here and I want to also have conversations, but I'm gonna show you one more uh, example here on, I mean, I could give you more insights on different um, drawings, but let's just, uh, so we've, the other things we've been doing is making online courses and you could just uh, log in and see what's, what is happening there because even there designing with water has been done in ingenious ways in the past. So this is a water fountain in Venice. And if you're on an island, like you're here, you often don't have access to fresh water from the ground. Uh, so they depended on rainwater and this rainwater was captured through in these plazas, if you ever you've been in Venice, mostly I see tourists sitting, um, see tourists sitting there eating food from McDonald's, but the water is actually trickling into the ground through the sand and then it's coming up in the uh, as drinking water. The only problem is whenever there's a flooding in Venice, which regularly happens, then you have to clean out the entire sand uh, and replace it. So again, it, it requires a lot of community practices to make these kinds of systems actually work. Now, in terms of, uh, um, well, we've also made a game about this, this idea, but, there are also real architectural questions involved in it. This was a project from one of my students, Klaus de Jong, and he came to me and said, I want to make peace between Israel and Palestine. And I love my students. Uh, so, and he, wants to, he said, I want to use water to do this. So he explored the different types of typologies of water, the different densities of water, and then he looked into traditional water practices in the area, and he came up with this water temple in which he had everything from groundwater, all the different types of water, hammams, and local usages of water in one temple. Uh, it actually got us in trouble with the Israeli embassy, but that's a whole lot different story then. So this, these are highly political things, but they're also real architectural uh, designs. And I think I'm going to just to, well, I can, could, could go on about the commitments that we are currently writing and so on and so forth. But let me, let me stop here and let me open it up and I can always bring some slides back if you like. Thank you. And I do see some people with cameras on online. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we don't see you on the screen, but let me, let me, can I, if I stop, I can probably let yeah, me stop you, share. You field the question and I'll take care of it. There's Thank any questions. you so much for this wonderful lecture. Are there questions in the audience for our students? And online world, please do feel free to speak or to. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, it's, it's running from my computer. <laughs> any, any questions here? Otherwise, I, I, I dare you now to ask questions. So you better ask questions yourself. Or I can ask, I can stop. You guys have a question? The smiling and meeting, slight smile. So. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Kind of not fully formed in my mind yet, but um, I'm just wondering about how you think about these issues in terms of um, heritage with respect to landscape in particular, not necessarily, um, you know, as you described so beautifully, all of, all of the Netherlands is designed right in the sense that it um, is designed at below sea level and so there's so much management of systems and infrastructure to do that um, but when you think about water and land is it is it still the case that we could think about it as an entirely binary condition of dry land versus i'm thinking of you know like philip de Kuma's work on wetness as opposed to mm -hmm. thinking about a line separating what is wet from what is dry and how how would thinking about that be useful for heritage, or is it just further obfuscation that's getting us further away from what we how we might think about this? Yes, I'm not going to bring up. I skipped one part. Mm -hmm. So 
I completely agree. That's exactly what we're trying to do. So we must just made a special issue on porosity mm -hmm. and trying to rethink the relation between water and land. Mm -hmm. So that we do not say it's a single line. There's one, so it's, it's, it's an open access journal, uh, it's urban planning journal with, under the theme of porosity. There's one article in there that tracked the, the way that water and land have been historically reshaped. So whether you have a stair, whether you have a slope, whether you have a wall, will change your relationship with water. Or if you have even a, a little thing to stand on or whatever it is. So that, that is exactly the point I think that we need to do. So we're, we're gonna do a studio on tidal architectures um, and, and uh, with the idea, how can we design architectures that speak to exactly that problem? I mean, the, the Nile example, the ancient example you gave, people yeah. live there seasonally based on the, the flooding pattern. But then, yeah, what are the implications of that for, for thinking about landscape in a way that's not fixed? And then, therefore, how does that influence how we think about what is the architectural in thinking about how water influences the built environment? Right, I mean, it starts, Rachel Alderman, uh, for example, argued that every water body should have a one kilometer public zone next to it. I mean, I, I just imagine doing this in, 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 in Manhattan. <laughs> I don't know how you would Maybe get there. The Manhattan yeah. <laughs> would not be left. Manhattan. Right, so that, that's a start, but the, so it goes from the landscape scale to the urban scale, to the city scale, and to, to, to the building scale, to think about how we can do diff different ways with water. And I mean, just to give you one, one more concrete example from Hamburg, for example, everything that's beyond the dike um, regularly gets flooded. And I used to hearing on the radio, get your cars out of that area, otherwise they will be gone, you have an hour to do so. Which is fine, but we just have to live that way and accept that if we don't move with the water, we are in trouble. And so they have pedestrian bridges that are high enough that they won't get flooded. There is even one um, restaurant coffee that has such thick glass so that they can stay open. And when it floods, you actually see the fish swimming <laughs> outside. And uh, well, so, but those are the kinds of interactions I think that we have to rethink whether it's temporal. So we move out and come back in, different types of architecture, whether it's withstanding, but living with water, whether it's floating architecture. I think we have all kinds of options. Sukrit and then Maud. I just want to add to that um, question in the landscape, which uh, a very interesting case study actually, which we were doing and I would love to share with you as well. Uh, just, I think around 2013, we were working on a, um, from the archaeological survey of India, we were working on a monument called the Kumar Sun Temple. And a very uh, weird, uh, you know, kind of problem came to us that it's it's starting to flood. Now it's a monument uh, very close to the sea, and it has never flooded in the last 300, 400 years. We have never, never, never found any historic data about the flooding in that area. And suddenly there's rain, and you know, it, it started flooding with fresh water, which became a concern because the, the stones out there are not used to stagnant fresh water. So when we actually went to do the study, uh, you know. We were like, you know, we don't see any problem with the slope. We actually found out that the landscape architects who worked on it has completely changed the soil pattern of that area, which had, which was initially sandy soil, but they have now converted that into the conventional, uh, the, you know, landscape design that we are doing in all monuments, and which has resulted in that flood. So I think, you know, there is definitely a very important, uh, you know, aspect of landscape in terms of the relationship we're building with the water, which we have to keep in mind. I just, I just couldn't stop and resist myself. So, <laughs> you know, like, so fascinating because we spent a lot of money just to understand, understand what's wrong with the slope suddenly. Yeah. But then we understood everything's fine. It's the soil that's right. the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So. Maybe mouth first and then huh? Yeah, um, I don't have a super clear question, but just thinking about heritage and then um, the heritage is also conver conservation or remembering something which is maybe like fixed in time. But then thinking about water bodies and rivers, like which are definitely not fixed in time. Um, so, do can we understand heritage also as something which is flexible or 
And it's a really interesting question because art, so first of all, it's a cultural question. If you go to Japan and you have these temples that are being rebuilt every 25 years, because the idea is that the knowledge should be preserved, not the exact material. In Europe, we would think about it needs to be the exact same stone that has stayed in the same space with the same mortar, etc. But we don't necessarily build for things to be preserved this way. When we make plastic, the architect said, well, plastic is, is a material to be wasted. And now we have, what do we do? How to conserve that kind of heritage? So it's, it's both cultural and it's also different in say landscape design. If you have a garden, if you have Central Park and you, it, it's a monument, well, how do you preserve a tree? It's just not staying the way it was, right? It's constantly changing. So it means so it's growing up uh, and it has to be cut down or it is being changed. So maybe even thinking through landscape heritage as a perspective, we can have new, th new ideas for cultural heritage, but it's definitely a question that you need to rethink what we consider heritage, whether it's the heritage in our minds, whether it's the heritage on the ground, whether it's the stones themselves, whether it's the, the original design of a garden. Yeah, so it depends on each different thing that you're seeing as heritage, how do you treat it as a person? I think so. I mean, it's in, that's why I find underwater heritage so fascinating, mm -hmm. because uh, and this is these are plenty of things that I learned through our blue papers. Um, so these fishing weirs, so traditionally people caught fish when the tide came in, the water was high, the fish swam into this stone circle or stone uh, area and the tide left and the fish were trapped and they could just pick up the fish. Now, with changing water quality, if it's more, more polluted, if it's more noisy, if it's whatever, the fish don't react. If it gets even a couple of centimeters higher, these things don't no longer work. So those are traditional practices, but even like sunken shipwrecks, which are, well, in Europe at least, often in the same waterways than the big container ships, et cetera, today, because the Romans tended or the Greeks used the same spaces. You have these conflicts between modern economy and historic heritage sites. So how can we do this for the benefits of both? And I mean, this is the whole question we're now celebrating, and I don't know here in the US, but in Europe, there's a lot of talk about the blue, the, the, the blue economy. Anybody here? No, 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 okay. I mean, there's the, so uh, at least in Europe, the European Commission is, and we actually have tomorrow a meeting on the blue economy. So everything that is water, marine, maritime related um, is very hot at this point. So how can we develop new water-based practices, practices? And the danger for me, at least when we think about the North Sea or the Baltic Sea, these are water bodies that have been emptied of meaning. As I said before, we used to have all kinds of sea monsters and practices with the sea. They've become blank and we've dumped all our industrial stuff into it. Drilling platforms, cables, pipelines, it's all in the water. And now if the land becomes too tight, windmills, uh, solar, swimming solar systems, all of it goes out into the sea as if there was not also meaning in that kind of areas. So that kind of relation is, is dangerous. And in that sense, I think the blue economy can be very dangerous if it's done well. Um, so Europe has now these uh, Natura 2000 sites, so protected uh, water areas. They're quite extensive. Maybe then the blue economy can also be beneficial in helping protect these areas. So you could talk about 3D printed uh, reefs. Um, all of those kinds of practices would fall under this bigger theme of the blue economy. Not sure if I know. Yes. Um, so I like the sea monsters thing. It's like, you know, we kind of stripped uh, the sacredness of water and the uh, mystery of it. Um, it feels like everything in our culture is like extracted from, like we just had a devastating train crash in the United States that polluted the entire surrounding area because the company was extracting profit from an existing infrastructure. And, um, you know, as water becomes this thing we fight over in the century, um, you know, 
it, it feels like water should be the one thing that we don't extract profit from. It should be the one thing that humans can agree is like, you know, we don't need to take from it. We can, we can give to it, but you know, greed is a very powerful force. And I'm wondering if you've learned that like through water, through studying water, this one thing that all humans share, you know, is there some glimmer of hope? <laughs> Looking at the other students, you're watching your challenge and super. Yeah, and, uh, there is a, well, this is not about hope, quite the opposite. Uh, a colleague of ours from, from the Netherlands studying Curacao and this one state island in the Caribbean, they used to be Dutch colonies. And there are studies about the quantity of water used by a local person versus the quantity of water used by the classic tourist. Well, the tourist used five times the same amount of water than the local. The, the, the desalination plants on the island, this is the only way that they collect the, for creating fresh water other than rain, are mainly used for tourist purposes. So this water goes to hotels and, uh, and to cruise ships, not to local people. So there is definitely a lot of greed in water because it's an essential asset. And the, 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 only, the only initiative of valuing water is what we are, well, not we are trying to do, but many people are trying to do is to try to find different ways of evaluating this. So not just as a financial asset, not just as a, as a resource to sell or to buy, because indeed there are much more meaning attached to it. Mm -hmm. So maybe, so today the UN's one person was saying the house is burning, but we're kind of locking in the doors. So the, this is why the continent is here, because we have a huge water problem. And the area of awareness is over, we have to take action. So the, that's basically the message that I'm getting out. Now, how to do that is what, where to start. That's one of the big problems. And I think, and so that you can also probably speak to that, but the, the problems are even bigger in, in the small island states or in, in, in Africa and in places that there is already less water use. The problem is bigger. The one colleague in one of the three people in the who said the one American in terms of water use equals something like two Europeans equals whatever, 10 Asians and uh, 30 Africans. So how can we change it? And what is the role of architects in doing it? So I cannot really give you the glimmer of hope other than saying, I think the awareness is finally setting in. Um, I don't know how it works now in the US. I still have no, no, I, I, I was going to ask a question that maybe is related, maybe not, but just um, flipping it back to, to land and land value. And certainly there's a whole narrative here of historic districts and uh, restricting what can be done on the land, but also increasing the value of the land or the property that, it, that is associated with it so that there's there's real estate, there's speculation, there's, there's value attached to the mm -hmm. heritage. And you hinted at it many times. Uh, with respect to which heritage is is considered valued and recognized, and what might be erased or or not, um, and then it's implicated in in um, in real estate, in in codes and regulations. Um, and I was just curious. Uh, your examples are um, not North American, and whether you could perhaps share with us or, or talk about what regulatory structure you think ought to be changed in North America that you're familiar with or, or you know what some of the, the particular um, barriers or, or challenges are here I, mean, I see it in zoning codes you know ownership of land but mm. I'm curious in your, your yeah. thoughts of, of that mm. I, so my experience is mostly more Philadelphia than New York although New York has this uh, has Hamilton um, Alexander Hamilton, who designed the, the the public water system in New York, right? Or what is it? it the public the, the uh, Patterson, New Jersey. Okay. First industrial town using mills and the, right. the power of the waterfall there. So he designed the banking. Okay. Well, right. uh, Aaron Aaron Aaron, Aaron, exactly. That's the, guy the story. Who killed it designed mm -hmm. the first water wells. There you okay. go. <laughs> that 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 was the story exactly. But I, there's the musical now. All the same. But what I like about Philadelphia is, for example, the Schuylkill watershed education. So they really try to get, go into watershed development, which is interesting, and also to think about water comprehensively. Um, ah, 
I'm, I mean, they, I have more questions than I have answers, I think, because I, I'm wondering if you might know. So I'm going to return the answer by the question to you, and then I have maybe one more European example. But uh, what about all the water towers in 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 uh, in Manhattan, for example? Are they part of the building? Are they part of the building code? How are they designed? And where does the water, how is the water pumped up there? I mean, even going back to your question, how public, is the water a common good or is it a private good? Do you, I mean, how? It's public up to six floors. Really? And then, and then, I mean, not legally, but just in terms of the physics, and then you have to, then it's up to you. Yeah, okay. Responsible, the building is responsible for getting it up. There, so that you can have water pressure on the floor. Our water pressure goes up six stories. So if it's above that, you need to pump the water all the way up and have it come it's down. All specialty business, yeah. though, in those those tanks that are yes. special wood, and they have to be designed and and you can't paint the wood, regular. but they look older than they are. But a lot of them are still working. Huh. I think most of them are fairly good because of the elevation of the reservoir. So that's why they're all in the same type buildings. Mm -hmm. So they come from the reservoir down and fill to that. You don't see them on shorter or taller buildings. Mm -hmm. Also depends on the topography. Right, right, right. Um, so they're natural. Most of they're used for fire protection. Some buildings I lived in one where it's used as part of water. I mean, so for example, I mean, but I don't know the US, so I'm really relying on you or don't remember as much on that. But there's maybe two more design examples that I find fascinating. So in, uh, in Japan, for example, in Tokyo, the streets are so small, 75% of Tokyo has less than four meter wide streets, so the fire engines can't get through. So they have uh, a lot of water plazas that both serve as playgrounds for kids and as, uh, well, as fire, fire uh, emergency places. Um, and, oh, well, actually this could be, it's not an, this could be one of the examples that came up on our discussions is what if um, architecture schools made a project, all the American playgrounds that are currently black box have to be water parks. Mm -hmm. I think you could already solve quite a number of, of, of projects and it might speak to your question to make it a common good. Well, maybe all the public plazas should be one of the water solutions. Uh, and that when I was before I left, sorry, wait a second, but before I left the US in 2014, there was a big meeting in New York on water where they were talking about. So, th this is one of the things that I remember, um, maybe partially an answer. You have a, you, you pay a fixed amount for being part connected to a water company, and then you pay consumption, right? Mm -hmm. So, people will. Start, and it was also done to make people save money so that they measured their own consumption. But that didn't work out as planned. So actually the incomes went down, I was told at the time in New York. And the other problem, they did that also in Germany, but our sewage system is built for a certain amount of water being flushed through. So as individual people start saving water, there's not enough water to flush the system. Which means that they will use another bunch of fresh water to just flush the system. So it ultimately doesn't save water, it just puts the burden of funding again on the public sector rather than the private sector. So that it's, it's so complex and that you really have to think it through all the way before you even think about the tiny funds. I think yes. you have a question from the oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I see how um see how why don't you unmute yourself oh. and ask your question? <laughs> okay. Uh, can you unmute yourself? There you go. He's one of our professors. Okay. Hi. Yeah. I may be able. Well, is it working? Yes. Oh, I don't actually hear an echo. Okay, great. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much for the uh, the lecture. I actually have a question related to uh, what you said about you know because um, you mentioned you know what if all the you know parks turn into you know water parks, uh, but the you know the thing is that. Uh, I guess in, in the U.S., um, we have this kind of a hard divide between, you know, architecture and engineering and especially landscape architecture and engineering. Um, and if you think about it, so uh, landscape architecture as a profession is actually uh, considered an engineering degree outside U.S. in many countries. It's an engineering profession, but somehow in the U.S., 
it's considered a uh, you know art or non scientific or non engineering. And uh, a lot of times, you know, even landscape architects has this kind of, uh, in, in the US, I'm saying, has this kind of self-sectioning, sanctioning practice of, you know, trying to distance ourselves from engineers. And uh, so um, I, I just want to, you know, wonder, can you maybe comment on this, um, on this difference, uh, on this difference uh, attitudes towards, uh, cultural attitudes towards engineering and towards, uh, you know, technology? And uh, yeah, I'll just, you know, end there. It's a really interesting question because, and I think it's, so on the one hand, we have water management and civil engineering. And on the other hand, we have landscape designers, right? At least for in, in our faculty. So we have architects and we have civil, civil engineers that sit in even in different, in different buildings in Delft. Maybe one of, the, so one of the, ways to solve that the problems we are facing would be if the civil engineering people at least when i think about our faculty understood words like social value or culture and i've tried and i'm, I'm talking about we've, we've set up a new minor um where th that is transdisciplinary and so i got some students from civil engineering and to study robotics and these kind of things and they actually came to me and said, I've never heard the word social value before. So we, we see that the, the, different, um, the different disciplines have very different approaches. So on the one hand, if we could get our students to be much more engineering savvy, um, even in, the, in, in our landscape project, I would, in our landscape program in Delft, there's one colleague working, for example, with dredging. And so that gets maybe closer to the potential of bringing urban design or landscape design and uh, engineering closer together. Because then you have to deal with sediments, you have to deal with uh, all kinds of hydrolog hydrological conditions, and then to use dredging to actually design new landscapes. Not sure if it answers your question. So yeah. we should probably Thank you. Um, wrap up but there any more questions got one here a line that struck me from the beginning of the lecture is when you said that we think we could engineer a solution to the problems we created for ourselves so i was wondering if you can kind of elaborate on the failures from governments but also like designers like architects and engineers where we try to create solutions for the effects of the problem rather than changing the way we design to mitigate the existence of the problem I think there's two two layers to what you're asking. So if we think about the the big dams, the energy generating dams in the United States, last summer there was so much drought that these uh, dams that were designed to to create energy no longer worked. Right? At least it made it over into the press in Europe. Now, in the beginning, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we had hunger, we had lots of problems, and we thought that the availability of seemingly free and unending energy would be the solution. And the bigger we built the structures, the more we could solve the problems of humanity. So I'm saying the engineers and the architects, they did it with a good purpose. They didn't do it to harm us, but they tried to harness these, these forces at, at a scale that now turns out to be a problem. So what Matteo was also hinting at before, for example, the World Bank would fund dams and dikes, huge infrastructures around the world that displaced more local communities or destroyed local knowledge, ignored local knowledge. And only now are we slowly coming to the point and coming back. I had one student at Bryn Mawr who looked at it in, in South America, where people were asked to go back to traditional practices after having been told by the same World Bank, whatever, 20, 30 years before, no, you should abandon them. So those are the kind of ways where we have put way too much money into technology, into large scales that has taken the power away from the individual. And yes, so maybe that's the what I try to answer. That might be a, a good, good place to, to wrap up. Oh. Okay. Uh, Alex, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah. 
kind of like echoing what um, Professor Sang said. Um, you know, right now there's like my question first of all is like architects are learning about like earth science systems and biodiversity trade-offs or externalities you know like as you were saying they need to have like this holistic approach but i want to know uh where are they in terms of that just because um to bring a little context uh by adjusting human water security systems those threats create threats in biodiversity cycles and then end up like rounding back to um humans so i just shared in your chat i think uh, a couple of like good initiatives that are working in like just mapping dual threats to water security systems and biodiversity not sure that i 100 percent understand your question is the question that how could architects use nature-based solutions to add to biodiversity so are they learning right now like because just also in the presentation i didn't see a lot of biodiversity mm -hmm. externalities or trade-offs um are architects in their program in the eu uh learning about uh biodiversity and earth systems i think it, this is something we really need to start and do much more um so there is in in, in the netherlands that you're completely right that I didn't talk about that, but there's more attempts at bringing this back. So there's this ZOOP initiative, ZOOP meaning life from the Greek, uh, to have a speaker for the for the non-humans involved in, in, in all kinds of activities. So you could bring a ZOOP, you could make architecture a ZOOP and think about how the building impacts the different types of nature that it actually engages with. So those kinds of... It, it, initiatives start to exist but it's really i think a a very slowly growing field yet so there's plenty of room to do new things all right so i, th I think we should wrap up if you have other questions i'm sure you come up and sure, talk, sure. But thank you so much carl <laughs> and there's some books up here i don't know if you heard that at the beginning i believe right yes exactly so help yourself check them check them out <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Very long day, but that was great. It was, it was really good.